My name is Lauren Bennett. I'm the lead product engineer on the Spatial Stats team. Uh, we work on building the tools that we're going to talk about today. Um, this is my colleague, Janora DaCosta, who is also on the Spatial Stats team and responsible for our documentation um, and also building all the tools that we're talking about. This is Flora Vale, who is a product engineer on the analysis team more broadly. We're all kind of underlying on the analysis team. Um, Flora focuses on charts and data visualization in Pro, um, but is also kind of an honorary member of our team, helping us with data visualization and charting and helping us make some of these uh, beautiful slides that you'll see today. Uh, there's some particularly fun ones today, I think. So what we're going to talk about today is um, essentially pr making predictions. Um, this is a workshop that for a long time was just called Beyond Where Modeling Spatial Relationships, um, and we focused exclusively on OLS and GWR. Today we are going to spend a little bit of time in the beginning talking about OLS and GWR, um, and then we're going to spend the second half talking about the, the new force-based classification and regression tool. And really at the heart of all of that, is this concept of a model. And the idea behind a model is that it is this thing that represents reality in some way that will be useful to us. So it's a generalization of something that we can then use, in our case, to make predictions. We use models for, for all sorts of things in the world. We have a model airplane, you can think of a role model as a useful generalization that we might follow the path of, or a supermodel, a very realistic generalization <laughs> of reality. Um, some models are more useful than others. Um, but in, in this case, we're talking, I don't mean that supermodels aren't like useful people, they're lovely, I'm sure. <laughs> They have lots of worth. I'm just saying, in terms of if you looked at the, if you thought of that as a, the, a good example of a prediction model, your predictions would be pretty off most of the time, I think. Um, so our goal in the case of these regression tools and these prediction tools is to create a model that generalization of of reality that will help us make accurate predictions. Right, that's our goal. So. Why do we model? Well, it's to predict information that we don't have. So it's to use information that we do have to predict information that we don't have. Um, so it might be predicting crop yield. We know where we have, we've got some data on crop yield and a bunch of attributes about those places, and we want to predict what crop yield will be in places that we don't have data. Lots of reasons we might want to make a prediction like that, because it impacts the global economy, it impacts the local economy, all sorts of reasons that we might want to make that kind of prediction. But it would be very expensive, time-consuming, and oftentimes impossible to have all of the data. So we're trying to use the limited data that we do have to predict that data that we don't have available to us. Now, we do have to be careful, because just because we have a model doesn't mean we have a good model, right? Um, there's a lot of ways that we can end up with a model that we can't trust, um, particularly in the case of machine learning methods that happens when we have a model that is fit too closely to the data that we trained it with, right? So we have this a data where we give it a set of data and it does a really great job predicting that data but when you throw new data at it it's not doing a good job predicting so it's it's absolutely fit directly to the data and doesn't actually generalize the generalization is a key part of these models right because the generalization is where we get to the point where we can act accurately predict places we don't have if it's not generalized and it's just following the exact data points, then it's only going to predict well for those exact data points. So we have to be very careful um, when we look at these models that we've found one that we can trust. And that's true whether we talk about OLS and GWR, 
or we talk about something like the ran a random forest algorithm. We have to be very careful that we've found a model that we can trust, and we'll talk throughout the workshop today about how we do that, some of the ways that we can check diagnostics and evaluate our model so that we know that we found one that we can trust. You know, I, um, I was in a, I had a workshop this morning that I re we repeat right after this about, uh, it was, it's called machine learning in ArcGIS. And I've learned my lesson, I'm just gonna put machine learning in every uh, name of every workshop I have, fill the room. Because um, people are super into machine learning. Um, it's a very exciting buzzword. Um, we've been doing machine learning for a long time. It's the same way that people are really into, be, uh, into the term data scientist, right? I can't tell you how many data scientists I've met recently, and I'll say, so how long have you been a data scientist? It's like, well, I've been doing analysis for you know two decades. Last six months, they changed my title to data scientist. It's like, okay, is, has your job changed at all? No, absolutely not, right? So they're doing analysis. Now they're called data scientists, that's great. I think that um, it's really important for us in this sea of buzzwords to not forget that these techniques, whether it's the traditional statistical techniques or the new machine learning techniques, they are not magic, right? They are just tools that we use as analysts to help understand the world better and to do things like make predictions. But it is still, the weight's still on our shoulders to evaluate the results of that analysis and to really understand the results of that analysis. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, we'll do our best to explain kind of how roughly OLS and GWR work and how roughly random forest works. At the end of that, will you be able to go home and write a random forest algorithm? Probably not. Might some of you decide you want to do that? Sure, that's great. I don't, what I'm, I'm not implying that that's what you have to do in order to appropriately, appropriately use these tools. We don't have to be, we don't have, all have to be engineers of machine learning algorithms to use them appropriately, but we do have to be knowledgeable about how the methods work so that we can use them appropriately. And so that's really our goal today, is to give you those tools and also the confidence that you're perfectly capable of doing it, right? Um, as much as I'm, I'm kind of cautioning that we have to be very careful about how we use these machine learning techniques, I also want to say it's not rocket science and you really are capable of doing it. You've been doing analysis just as hard as any of these other methods for years. And the, our goal is to put them in the software in a way that will feel natural to you and that will make it really approachable so that you can use it to solve important problems that you're all facing. So along these lines, we can think about some of the ways this can go wrong. <laughs> so here's one. We've got a really strong correlation between the divorce rate in Maine and per capita consumption of margarine. I'm going to guess that while butter is obviously better, <laughs> there is no real relationship between people getting divorced in Maine and consumption of margarine, right? This is not real. This is a perfect example of when models go bad, right? This is not a generalization of reality. This is a spurious correlation. There's all sorts of this kind of thing. We have to be very careful of these kinds of correlations. Um, for one thing, they're not going to help us make accurate predictions. And then we're going to say all sorts of crazy things out in the world that make no sense. Um, that won't help us implement policies that will actually impact change. Um, so we have to be aware of these diagnostics because the diagnostics help inform us like, hey, actually, it, more than just our common sense that says this doesn't make any sense, there's diagnostics that would make that really obvious too. Uh, similarly, uh, pretty high correlation between <laughs> the number of people who drowned by falling into a swimming pool versus the number of Nicolas Cage films. I mean, I don't love Nicolas Cage either, but I'm pretty sure people aren't like jumping in to swimming pools <laughs> as a result of him making movies or not. So we just have to be aware, right? Like it's funny, but then you read journal articles and the newspaper and this stuff is kind of everywhere, right? It's 
people love to find these correlations and talk about them, so we don't want to be those people. Uh, we want to do a better job than that. And we can't help it. A little XKCD. I used to think correlation implied causation. Then I took a stats class, now I don't. Sounds like it helped, maybe. <laughs> so maybe we don't have to be that careful about implying causation. <laughs> that seems safe, but um, we do want to be really careful. So there are many ways to model. You could get a PhD in modeling, okay? I mean, I don't know if that's an actual thing. You could, you could get a PhD <laughs> in anything, but you could take many years of classes on all of the different algorithms out there, there to do this kind of modeling. We're gonna focus on three. Um, we're gonna start with ordinary least squares regression and geographically weighted regression. These are kind of traditional statistical methods in the sense that um, they aren't based on this concept of kind of training like a machine learning method is, and they're really about creating an equation. Um, and OLS is a non-spatial method, and GWR, you can kind of think of it as its spatial counterparts. Um, those have been in the software for a while, and we've got lots of resources about them, and we're gonna go through how OLS and GWR kind of work together and how we can feel good about the models that we find using OLS and GWR. Now, the other one we're gonna talk about is forest-based classification and regression. So this is where we put the random forest algorithm into ArcGIS. It's brand new in Pro 2.2, and we're super excited about it. Um, some things that I'll tell you about it. Um, one, is we called it forest-based classification and regression instead of calling it random forest. It is the random forest algorithm. That's an open algorithm out there that lots of software has. We did all of our validation against a lot of different software packages. And it's, it's nothing, it's, we didn't do random forest differently, really. We, impl we, we approached the user experience very differently um, than any other random forest out there, but the core underlying random forest algorithm is what's in the software. You run it in R, you run it in scikit-learn, same underlying algorithm. Each, each package out there do, makes decisions, and we had to make some decisions too, but the, the core algorithm is, is the same. Now, we didn't call it random forest uh, because there is a uh, trademark on the term random forest, um, so, we don't, we don't want to break any trademark laws. So it's called forest-based classification regression based on the underlying algorithm that was originally kind of um, worked on by Leo Bryman. So that's one thing to know. The other thing that I think is kind of, that we, we've put these together um, because they, in, at the end of the day, in, a, in both cases, one of our goals is prediction. Um, there are some differences. You know, someone's going to ask, or you're already thinking, well, when do I use one versus the other? Um, really, it depends on what your goal is. It also depends on your data. Whichever one gives you the best prediction is the one you're going to use, right? Because you, what you care most about is getting a great prediction. There's a lot of beauty and simplicity in OLS. Um, in general, with analysis, there's this concept called uh, parsimony or it's, it, it kind of comes back to this idea of, of Occam's razor. It's this idea that you wanna use the simplest method possible and nothing simpler. So OLS is one of the simplest regression methods out there. It's, it's very clean. There's a lot of diagnostics. It has been around forever. It is very reliable. So if you got a great model using OLS that you could trust, I'd say go with OLS. It's a great regression method, and it is unquestioned, really. Um, now, forest-based classification regression doesn't have all those same diagnostics. It's not, its foundation isn't, all of these machine learning methods have some foundation in statistics, but it's not statistics. There's not the same you know, levels of confidence and statistical significance that you get in a traditional regression analysis. So while you may get a really great prediction, there are some things you can't say. It's, it's even more problematic to, to talk about relationships. 
in the same way that we are drawn to when we say, okay, these are the explanatory variables related to my prediction, so therefore this caused that. We really can't say that, right? We can say this is a great predictor of this. Why is it a great predictor? That's a challenge and short of doing actual experiments, it's very hard to answer that question. Um, of course, my other go-to is always try both um, and kind of see where, how you're going to get the best result because ultimately that's what we care about is just getting the best result for our data. It's based on the shape of the relationships. OLS is a linear regression method. If you have really complex data relationships, you may not be able to find a good model and random forest may be a, a better approach. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it off to Janora who's going to talk about OLS and GWR. All right. So we're going to start by talking about um, ordinary least squares, or OLS. Um, and this is a regression method uh, used for modeling linear relationships. Um, we're going to start by going over the math. Um, don't be scared. This might be intimidating. You might feel like you've chosen the wrong workshop at this point. But we're really just going to use this as an illustration or a map um, to go over some of the terminology that is important to understand what's happening um, under the hood in OLS. So we're going to start by defining uh, our dependent variable. And that's going to be the y on the very left-hand side of the equation. And this is just what we're interested in modeling, what we're interested in predicting, what we're interested in understanding. We also have explanatory variables. These are all the x's in the equation. Um, and these are all the variables that you believe um, cause or explain or have a relationship uh, some, type of a, some type of relationship to the dependent variable. Um, these are also called independent variables. I think we prefer the term explanatory variables just because it's a little bit more descriptive, right? This is what's explaining why. We also have coefficients, and you'll notice that all the coefficients come before the x's. Uh, and these coefficients is what represents the strength of the relationship and the type of relationship that all of these x's, the explanatory variables, have to our y on the other side of the equation. Uh, these coefficients uh, can have different types of relationships. They can have a positive relationship. So as obesity rates rise, uh, diabetes rates also rise. They can have a negative relationship. So as foreclosure rates rise, uh, home values are actually dropping, so they're having the opposite effect. Um, or there could be no relationship at all. Um, and if you have a variable and you're finding it doesn't really have a relationship, it probably doesn't belong in your model, right? It's not impacting the model at all. Um, and these coefficients are really a, kind of the most important part of OLS, right? Because they're telling us the explanatory, they're t the coefficients are telling us the relationship that the explanatory variables have and also the strength of the relationship in the model, in the equation. Uh, the last thing is the residuals, all the way on the right. And these are the model over and under predictions. So when we create a model, we're basically creating this prediction line, right? And we have a predicted value, you can see in the red, it falls along that line. And then we have our observed values, right? So we've built this model on data that we know, right? So our observed value in the green there um, falls below the line. So we actually have an over prediction for that feature. Um, and an over prediction. So the difference between where our prediction falls on that line and our actual value is an over prediction. You can also have under prediction, so those green dots on above the line, those rep represent under predictions. Um, and these res residuals are really important because this difference, it's basically telling us um, what wasn't represented or what wasn't explained with the model that we've created. So these residuals are very important. Um, okay, so we've got dependent variables, we have explanatory variables, coefficients, and residuals. And that's really all there is to know about OLS. <laughs> so that equation wasn't quite as scary maybe as it seemed like it was in the beginning. <laughs> 
Um, it is important, like Lauren mentioned, that <coughs> we need to be able to trust our model. We need to find a model that we can trust. Um, and finding a properly specified model is uh, usually very iterative, maybe kind of painful. Um, it requires a tenacity, a lot of research, hard work, and maybe some luck. Um, in order to find a model that we can trust. But there are a certain set of diagnostics that you can look at um, in order to evaluate the model that you, that you have come up with. So we're going to go through a couple of those. I will say that we're going to go through these diagnostics quickly, but in the documentation, uh, the documentation dives a lot deeper into each one of these diagnostics. So I would point you in that direction. And it's, wanna... it's great doc and you'll find it very useful. Janor can't say that because she's responsible for all the documentation, <laughs> but I can say it. I promise you'll find the doc, particularly when it comes to these regression tools, uh, very, very useful. It's hard to find understandable document or understandable anything about regression analysis, maybe statistics in general. And we try really hard to be an outlier there in terms of the usefulness. <laughs> I'm sorry. <good. laughs> okay, so let's um, go th through some of these uh, criteria, some of the assumptions that OLAS makes, and um, just things to check in order to make sure that you have found a model that you can actually trust. Uh, so the first thing is each variable in your model should be statistically significant, right? And so this is just really tell, it's making sure that each variable, variable that you include in your model is telling an important part of the story, right? We want it to be statistically significant. So in the messages, you're gonna wanna make sure that each one of your variables has an asterisk beside it. Um, that's telling you that that variable is statistically significant in your model. Uh, the second thing is you want each variable to be important in the model, but you also want each variable to be telling a different part of the story. Um, and that is measured through a variance inflation factor, VIF value. Uh, you don't want any of these values to be above 7.5. Um, and this is really getting at redundancy. So you don't want two variables in your model that are kind of getting at the same thing. So a lot of times we explain this like, you're, maybe you're modeling housing prices and you have one variable that's square footage and you include a, another one that's number of bedrooms or something. Those two variables are really getting at the same thing, which is just how big is the house, right? So you want to make sure each variable is statistically significant, but then is also telling a different part of the story. Um, your residuals should not be clustered in location or in value. Um, so they shouldn't be clustered in value. We, we evaluate this using the hark barris statistic. And it's basically measuring, um, it's be basically telling you if your residuals are normally distributed. So in an ideal model, you want your over and under predictions to be as close to zero as possible, right? The difference between the predicted and the, ac and the actual value. So you would hope that most of your values are close to zero, and then you might have a few that are that are larger than zero and fewer and fewer, kind of creating this normal distribution, this bell curve. So you want to make sure that your residuals are um, normally distributed or or random. Um, they should also not be clustered in location. Um, so you can use the uh, spatial autocorrelation tool, uh, run it against your residuals, and it will tell you if they are clustered. Um, or dispersed or, or random. Um, this is important if you have, I guess when we get into GWR, this is important. If you have an area of your study area where your predictions, the residuals are clustered, there might be something in that, er you might want to interrogate that area because you might be missing something in your model, right? Something's happening in that area um, that isn't being explained in the model and that would be really important information uh, for you to know. So the residuals should be random. Um, and then the last check that we'll kind of mention today is model performance, right? So you need a good R squared. Uh, we talk about this last, but honestly, it's the first thing that we look at, probably. <laughs> probably all of you also just check the R squared first, right? But the truth is, you could have the best R squared, and if you haven't met all of these other criteria, um, you can't trust the model, right? Because you haven't met the assumptions, you haven't met the criteria of, of, a, of a model you can trust. Um, 
Just, I guess, one more plug. The online help <laughs> is actually helpful. Again, um, there's a bunch of tips, tricks, best practices. Uh, this process of finding a good model is always iterative. There is a table of common things that go wrong and how to fix them. Um, and I would just like to point you in that direction. I didn't actually write this doc, so I can plug. <laughs> sure, yeah. I just it. Um, OK, so the next tool that we're going to talk about is exploratory regression. Um, and we've. I've mentioned this process of finding a model you can trust is really iterative, and exploratory regression can help with that process. So basically, you point to your dependent variable, you input all of your explanatory variables, and this tool is actually going to test all of the combinations of those, uh, of those different variables in order to find a model you can trust. And it's not only checking the R squared, it's also going through all of those diagnostics um, and, and testing those combinations for you. Um, in just one one of the tool. So it can be very, very helpful. And it can be helpful for finding a, a model you can trust, a properly specified model, but it can also just be helpful you know, to learn and explore the relationships in your data. Um, it can help that way also. Um, so at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Flora, and she's going to run us through these two tools. OK, let's take a look at how OLS works in Pro. So I have, I'm looking at some um, Medicare spending data, and I created a hotspot map of Medicare spending per capita across the country. And ideally, we would hope that Medicare spending would be pretty equitable across the country, right? But we're seeing that we actually have like a really big hotspot of higher spending in this area in the southeast. So I want to use regression analysis to try to figure out why that hotspot exists and why variation in Medicare spending exists. So really, OLS is getting at trying to explain the variation in those values. Um, so I'm going to focus just on this hot spot here. And I'm going to try to run the OLS tool with my very first guess, which is, you know, perhaps the population is just really unhealthy, and that's what's causing higher spending. So my dependent variable, again, that thing that I'm trying to explain, so total costs. And then for my explanatory variable, I'm going to try average HCC score. So HCC score is an indexed, index used to measure the health of a population based on the prevalence of chronic conditions like heart disease and diabetes, et cetera. So I was thinking maybe the people are just sicker, and that's why we're spending more money. So our tool has completed, and we have our messages window here. And the messages window for um, all of the tools, but particularly for the um, OLS and GWR tools, is really important because that's how we understand the diagnostics and if we can trust our model. So looking in here, we get a bunch of diagnostics, and we get an adjusted R squared of 0.65. So that's pretty good. I mean, explaining variation in Medicare spending by using just one variable and getting a 65% explanation of that variance is really exciting. But the reason that Janora left strong R squared for last when explaining how to tell if you can trust your model is that we can't trust our model based on R squared alone. Otherwise, we would all stop eating margarine to keep our marriages together. <laughs> um, you'll notice that at the bottom of the tool, we have this friendly little warning that says, use the spatial autocorrelation tool to ensure that the residuals are not spatially autocorrelated. So one of the many things that we have to check is if our residuals are clustered in space. And the default output for the OLS tool is this residual map. So I don't even need to run the spatial autocorrelation tool to know that these residuals are clustered. Just visually, we can tell. All of the overpredictions are over here. All of the underpredictions are over here. So there's something missing from our model. Our model is biased, and it's not going to do a good job predicting in outside of this study area. So we're back to the drawing board. What do we do? Well, exploratory regression is what we do. I'm going to point to the same features. My dependent variable stays the same. It's that total cost Medicare spending. And then I'm going to just select all of the different variables that I have associated um, with each one of these areas. 
Now, it's important to really be thoughtful about what variables you do include, um, because we don't want to find those correlations that are meaningless. And also, you want to remove the actual, you know, I can't explain total costs with total costs. That would be cheating. So I'll take that out. And then some other things like shape area, shape length. Um, and the unique ID. All right, so I'm going to run exploratory regression. And what it's going to do is it's going to look at every combination of those variables. So looking at one variable at a time, two, three, four, and up to five at a time, and seeing if we can pass all of those checks um, without me having to manually go through and try one by one, which can be a very long and hopeless process. So, <laughs> so looking at the results of exploratory regression, we see the different trials. So here it tried with just one variable. It's going to tell us the three variables that had the highest R squared, but where it says passing models here, we have nothing. So it's checking for clustering in the residuals in both space and in data space. It's checking for that VIF to see if there is a redundancy. It's checking to see if um, the, all the variables are statistically significant. And it's checking for a decent R squared. I think the cutoff is 0.5 for this. So none for one variable, none for two, none for three. For four, we get um, two passing models here with decent R squareds. And then when we look at five variables, we get an even stronger model. Um, so we're looking at the number of hospital beds, evaluation and management costs, the number of imaging events, so like MRIs, CAT scans, that sort of thing, the distance from Houston, because Houston is the largest medical center, I think, in the world. So sometimes including those distance variables can be really useful and the dehydration rates of the population. So the fi those five variables gave me an adjusted R squared of 0.86. And we passed all those different checks we can see here. So um, even though we still require a lot of thought and trial and error, exploratory regression is a great way of finding a model and also just getting to know your data. Now, I don't want to mislead you into thinking that Every time you run exploratory regression, it's just going to find a, a perfectly properly specified model for you because it's not. But even when it doesn't, it gives you a lot of information that helps you and leads you in the path to finding a good model. For example, it will give you a summary of variable significance. So imaging events, for example, were significant 100% of those trials. And 100% of the time, it had a positive correlation. Now, something like um, readmission rates was only significant 44% of the time, and 80% of the time it was positive, and 19% of the time it was negative. So maybe that variable is not going to help us find a model, and we can kind of throw that one out and go a different direction. It also gives us summary about multicollinearity or that uh, redundancy factor and about the different clustering. So exploratory regression, really useful tool in finding a properly specified OLS model. All right, so we found a properly specified OLS model, um, and we are going to move on to geographically weighted regression to explore spatial variations in our study area. And we do suggest um, that you use OLS to find a properly specified model before you move on to GWR. We're actually going to use the same model in GWR um, in a couple of minutes. Um, and that's just uh, because there's a lot of really great diagnostics with OLS. Um, there are diagnostics with GWR, but they're uh, not quite as robust. Um, so we do suggest that you start with OLS before moving into GWR. Um, OK, so the big difference between OL, the tool OLS and GWR is OLS is a global model, right? So it's using every single feature in your, in your study area to calibrate that equation. Um, with GWR, each feature in your study area is actually going to get its own separate OLS equation. And that equation is actually going to be calibrated, calibrated just based on the neighboring features. So the coefficients in one part of your study area, those the coefficients of the explanatory variables will change over space, depending on where you are in your study area. 
Um, and that equation itself is calibrated using neighboring features, right? And Lauren has mentioned a couple times in our workshops this week, uh, Tobler's Law, that things that are closer together are more related than distant features. And this is really reflecting that law, that first law of geography, because the only things that are affecting your equi the, this feature's equations are its neighbors, right? The things that are closer. So you're saying that um, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, predictors of my behavior here are, the, are my neighbors, the things around me, right? They're more important in my equation than things that are across town or across the country or very, very far away. So it's really reflecting that first law of geography. And Flora is going to show us how this tool works. Okay, let's go through this quickly so that we have time for forest-based also. So I ran DWR using those same five um, variables that we discussed earlier, and here is my output. Again, a map of the residuals. But since this is a um, local model, we have a different equation for each one of those features, which means I can map this and uh, symbolize these features in different ways. I can look at the local R squared and some of the different coefficients. So if I go to symbology here, and, and instead of looking at my residuals, if I look at maybe um, dehydration admissions, and is that not? Let's look at uh, imaging, maybe. What's going on here? We have them on the slide also. Do you just yeah, let's just look at the we'll slide. We'll just skip to this slide. So there's a number of different outputs um, with this tool. Uh, Flora was going to map the coefficients across your study area. You can also map the local R squared, so the R squared for every feature in your data set. Again, mapping the residuals is always interesting if there's areas where uh, well, your residuals shouldn't be clustered, clustered, but where those over and under predictions are happening, really digging in and looking at those areas can give you some information on um, improving your model. Uh, you can also map the condition model, the condition number, and this is really just um, how hard uh, the tool has to work in order to solve the equation in those areas. Um, so it, where it's working really hard to solve the equation in those areas, those uh, might also be interesting to look at. And then you can also map your predictions uh, using this tool. So like so. In, in the example with the coefficients here that I was trying to map, um, that was looking at uh, dehydration admissions. So the areas that are darkest have the strongest relationship with from between dehydration emissions and spending. So it doesn't mean that we have more spending there or more dehydration there. It just means that changing the dehydration will have the most effect on spending. So since our resources are limited and we can't um, fix everything everywhere, if we were to target our efforts and maybe implement a program to teach the elderly how to stay hydrated, we know we get the most bang for our buck in that darkest area because that's where dehydration has the largest effect on spending. So that's one of the ways that GWR can really help us target our efforts and focus um, remediation. So, so with that, we're going to swap over here really quickly. Musical chairs. <laughs> Okay, now let's get to the really fun new stuff. <laughs> Forest-based classification and regression. So prediction using machine learning. So fancy. <laughs> so fancy. We should have put that in the title. Um, <laughs> let me move my mic to this side since I keep looking in this direction. Make sure that I am heard. So I, to explain how this works, and again, you don't need to be a machine learning engineer to effectively use a machine learning tool and know when it's appropriate to use and how to interpret the results and how to explain the results. So I want to predict dog breed. And to predict this, I have to train my model, right? Every random forest model needs to be trained. So I'm going to give my model a set of dogs as examples. And for every dog, I'm going to give it some explanatory variables, so the size, color, fur, ear type, tail type, age, and weight of each one of my dogs. And then I'm also going to tell it what breed is assigned to each one of those dogs so that my model can learn how to identify dog breed. 
So the way that the random forest algorithm works is by using decision trees. So those different variables that I trained my model with, you can think of them as kind of splitting the data into different um, branches of a tree through different decisions. So here, I gave it this input of this dog up the top, and I said, what kind of dog is this? So it's going to find the variables that do best at splitting the trees. The first one was size. It was like, OK, well, big dogs on this side, little dogs on this side. It's a little dog. And then color. Well, it's a black and tan dog, so we'll lump it in here. And then lastly, does it have pointy ears or floppy ears? It has floppy ears. So it decided that it was a dachshund. And the way that random forest works is it's an ensemble of decision trees, hence the name forest. But the reason that it's called random forest is that each tree only gets a subset of the training data and a subset of those variables. And those subsets are random. So for every tree, it's going to get two thirds of the training data and a subset of those explanatory variables. And it's going to do its best to predict. So the tree in the middle got age, tail, fur, and color. It didn't get anything about size or weight. And age is not really a good predictor of breed. So <laughs> it, it messed up. And it guessed German Shepherd instead of Dachshund. Um, but since we have an ensemble of many, many trees, in the end, the majority vote here is going to win. And we're going to correctly identify this dog as a Dachshund. So that is uh, an example of how this would work for classification. So this tool works both for classification, which is when we are predicting a categorical variable, like dog breed, or like species distribution, uh, crime type, presence of disease, like yes, no questions. Will something be present here? Will something happen here? Those are all categorical variables or classification. But the tool can also be used for regression to predict a continuous variable, kind of like we did in OLS. So what is the rate of disease? What will be our sales profits? What will be the mortality rate? Those sorts of things. And so to train our model, we need to give it explanatory variables. And these variables can be attributes, they can be distance features, or they can be rasters. So for uh, explain explanatory training variables or those attributes, those are just other attributes in the table that includes your variable to predict. So if I gave the tool a table of um, dog breed, all those other attributes in the table would be explanatory training variables. So fur, size, weight, et cetera. Um, but we can also include other types of training variables like distance features. Now, this one is really neat because you can provide, let's say that you were trying to model air quality and distance from highways is important in your model. Kind of like distance to Houston was important in my model for Medicare spending. Now, instead of having to run the near tool the, to the nearest road segment, you can just put in the roads layer and the tool will calculate those distances for you. So I can just put in a road feature class and use that as one of my explanatory variables. And the last type is explanatory training rasters. So I can provide a raster surface, and values will be extracted from those pixels and used to help predict and to train uh, my model. And there are three prediction types. We could choose to train only, we could predict to features, or we can predict to rasters. So for training only, we're really just assessing the model performance. We're going to train the model and then look at the diagnostics. So how accurate is my model? How good of a job is it doing? Which variables are most important for prediction? But then we could also use that model to predict to features. So those features could be in your study area. If you had some missing values, you could predict to those. Maybe you want to predict two features in a different study area where you don't know the, the independent variable, or I mean the dependent variable, or you may predict to a different time period. So let's say that I know um, the crime rate today, and I know that population has a big impact on crime rate, and I have a population prediction for 20 years from now. 
I can use that to then predict the crime rate 20 years from now. And the last type is predictive raster. So if all of my input explanatory variables are rasters, then I can have the tool output a raster surface, predicting everywhere that all of my explanatory rasters covered. And again, with every model, it's important that we make sure that we can trust the results of our model. If we overfit our model, it will not predict outside of our training data set. And some ways that we can look at the diagnostics of the uh, forest-based classification and regression tool is by looking at the variable importance. So all of these will be given to you in the messages window. The variable importance basically tells us how well does each variable do in splitting those trees, those decision trees, so like splitting off into different nodes, how important, like weight was really important in deciding whether or not the dachshund was, um, uh, that dog was a dachshund or not. Age was really not that important, didn't do a good job in splitting the trees. Out of bag errors, so like I said, every tree only gets two thirds of the training data set, the out of bag errors runs the excluded one third of the data back through each tree and then sees how well that tree predicted the data that was not originally included. And we also have some model validation. So let's say that these were all of our training features. By default, the tool is gonna hold 10% back and we're only going to train the model with 90%. So we have that 90%, and then each tree only gets two-thirds of that 90%. But this 10% is not used at all until the end. Um, to validate the model, we check how well the forest did at predicting the features that were not used at all, that 10%. And that's for, for uh, regression cases when we're predicting a continuous variable we get an R squared value, similar to how we did in OLS, that will help us know how well we're doing with those predictions. Um, in the case, case of classification, it's a little bit more complicated. What it does is it creates a confusion matrix, which, let me tell you, is very appropriately named. <laughs> Not um, by us, but it is appropriate. <laughs> so it's gonna give you two different um, measures, a sensitivity and an accuracy. And basically all you need to know about this is that the sensitivity is the percent of times that Dachshun was correctly identified as Dachshun. So there were um, 10 potential, there were 10 that were identified as Dachshun and eight times it was correct. So eight out of 10 is the sensitivity. And the um, accuracy is kind of a more holistic view because it not only cares about how many times the dachshund was correctly identified as dachshund, but it also cares about the times that not dachshunds were identified as a dachshund. So both of those numbers are gonna help you determine how balanced your forest is. So that was a really quick whirlwind of how this works, but I think we'll get a better idea looking at a demo. So I'll pass it over to Lauren. Okay. And we'll see the tool in action. All right, so I'm gonna go through two examples, one looking at classification and the other one looking at regression. Um, there is a lot to this tool, not gonna lie. <laughs> there's classification and there's regression, there's a lot. So hopefully these two examples will give you kind of, there's a lot to it, but it's actually not that hard to do. It's just, you just have to start using it. That's the best way to get to know the tool. Um, so in this example, what we have are dengue fever cases. So we have known cases. And actually, this is kind of an interesting uh, setup. A lot of times, so this whole 0, 1, yes, no incidence is actually really tricky because a lot of times what we actually have is just yes. We don't have no. And that's a whole problem. Um, there's a lot of ways to deal with it. I'm not proposing that the way I've dealt with it here is the way to deal with it, but I'll tell you what I did, which is that I had already a data set that was a suitability map about dengue fever. And I had these known cases. And so what I did is I used a tool called 
create spatially balanced points. So the create spatially balanced points tool is actually a geostatistical analyst tool. And what I did was I gave it my raster, my suitability raster. And it'll put, basically, I'm trying to create the zeros. I know where the ones are, the places where dengue fever did happen. I need to train the model with where it did happen, but I also need, it to, give, I need to give it some places that it didn't happen. So what spatially balanced points did is it created this set of zeros for me, the, place, the, dark, the, dark, the black points. And those, what it does is it takes that raster and I tell it, essentially the high values are places where it's gonna put more zeros and it'll put less in the, in the lower values for my raster. So it's gonna use that raster to decide where it will put more or less of these points. It's gonna drop these random points. So now I have um, at least a best guess at where we think dengue fever might not happen, right? So I didn't just put it in the low suitability places. It will still put a couple in the higher suitability dengue places, right? Um, but it will put less there. So that's one way to do it. The ideal would be to have true zeros, right? But sometimes that's not the reality that we're living in. So now I've got my data, zeros and ones, which is often like three quarters of the battle. Now I also have a bunch of rasters that I think are related. I've got things about um, land cover. I've got some um, rasters that represent distances to rivers and to water bodies. I've got a bunch of temperature and other um, types of data about rainfall and climate in general. And I want to use all of these to, to help me predict where dengue fever is possible. Oh, the reason, this is an important note, the reason that I have for instance, this Euclidean distance from hotels. So it, where dengue fever will happen is a combination of kind of where the mosquitoes, it's a mosquito-borne illness. It's a terrible mosquito-borne illness that is um, quite prevalent and, and causes a lot of harm. Um, it's a combination of where those mosquitoes can exist and also where there are people. It's not just, okay, the mosquitoes are here, so dengue will happen here. It will only happen here if those mosquitoes are going to come in contact with people. So it's both of those things together. Now, Flora mentioned that our, our tool allows us to provide distance features. So why am I not just putting in the hotels or the rivers? Well, the reason is because in this case, I want to predict to a raster. I want to create a prediction raster, which means that I need to have a raster, only rasters as my explanatory variables, because I can only predict in places where I have data for everything. So the way that I create this prediction raster is you can think of it like every single point in that raster becomes a point I can predict to. But if only some of them are rasters, then I can't predict everywhere. I can only predict everywhere when every variable is, has a full coverage raster, right? So I have to create those distance rasters using something like um, the Euclidean distance tool in Spatial Analyst. So I, all I have to do is essentially point to all those rasters. I point to my incidents. I tell it that it's a categorical variable. As soon as I say treat as categorical, I'm running classification. It's just automatically going to be doing classification because I've told it that my variable to predict is a categorical variable. So it has to do a classification. There's no way to regress on a categorical variable. Now, for every explanatory variable that I provide, either, whether it's a, a field, or a raster, those themselves can be categorical. So both my variable that I'm predicting and all of those predictors can be categorical. Now, I could be predicting a continuous variable here, but use categorical explanatory variables. So basically, I can do a regression with a combination of both categorical and continuous variables, which is pretty powerful also. The, the trees allow for that kind of um, um, difference between the input variables. So we do, you do want to be careful, though, with categorical explanatory variables. The more categories a variable has, the more it's going to influence your, your model. So we're creating this decision tree. And the way, what happens with a categorical variable, with a continuous variable like age, it finds a break point and it says on this side it's this and on this side it's that. It can't do that with a category. Each category essentially becomes its own break point. 
So now you've created a var you've given it a variable that is, if you put, give it 50, var if, if it has 50 categories, it's like giving it 50 different variables. That variable is going to overpower your model. So you want to use categorical variables very um, judiciously. But sometimes they're critical and, and they can be very valuable. So essentially we go through, I'm not going to run it because this is a nationwide raster data set and it takes a little while, about a minute. We don't have a minute and we have the results. And we can take a look at some of those um, outputs. So one of the things we can see here is that our, rather than having an R squared, right, we have the diagnostics are in sensitivity and accuracy scores, right? So what this is telling us, essentially the sensitivity is telling us that 93% of the zeros were accurately classified as zeros. And 76% of my ones were accurately classified as ones. And that's based on the 10% of, of my data that got held back. I held back 10% and it's telling me 76 of that 10% I held back were accurately classified as ones or places where dengue would happen. And I have control over that parameter right from the geoprocessing tool. There's advanced forest options where I can set the percentage of the data, training data that I want to exclude for validation. Though there's a lot of other diagnostics in there, when I'm done saying, it's those out of bag errors that Flora told us about, um, when I'm done and I say, you know what, I found a really good model. I'm happy with this model. 76% is actually pretty good. Um, I might do something like up the number of trees. The more trees you use, the better your model is going to get, the longer it's going to take to run. I usually start with 100 just to see kind of roughly where I am and then start playing around with the number of trees and seeing how high it can go. Um, but once I found a really good model, when I want to go to prediction, you, what I want to do is change this to be a zero. I actually don't want to hold any data back when I create that final model that I'm going to use to predict. I just want to use all the data to create the best model that I can. So then all I have to do when I do that is switch to predict to raster. Now you can see when I went to predict to raster, my options for providing fields or distance features disappeared. They all have to be rasters here. Now that's my only option. Now I also have the option here to match these things. So let's say, and I've done this for this example, that I want to predict to um, a different country. All I'd have to do is instead of providing these same exact rasters that I did, I'd provide the rasters that represent that other country, let's say. Now it's going to use, it's going to train the model using the rasters in Kenya, and then it's going to predict using the rasters that I provide here. And it'll know one to one, okay, the one for altitude is this one for the other country I'm modeling. And so I can actually use a different study area if I want to and use the trained model in the one area. And as long as I have all the same variables somewhere else, I can predict there, even though I don't have any dengue data there. Now, I don't have a good way to validate that the model worked in that place unless I get some dengue data, which I would highly recommend, because now you've brought it to a new area. Can we definitely say that the factors related to dengue in Kenya are the same as they are in Colombia? No. But if we had some test data, we might be able to test that model. Okay, so really quickly, and it's kind of a recap of the plenary demo anyway, is this example where we're doing regression. So this is asthma hospitalization rates. I have some, a lot of missing data, and I want to predict to the block group. Now in this case, I, this is also, this is, unfortunately, this is another example where I'm not going to use the distance features, and I'll tell you why in this case, too. And I wanted to use these examples because if you're modeling points, you throw those distance features in, it'll calculate a distance to those points, and you'll, you'll be good to go. And then you want to predict to a bunch of other points, like home values is a great example. You have all the homes in a state. You have some portion of them where you know how much they sold for. You want to predict how much the others will sell for. You use a distance feature. It'll look, work beautifully. In this case, if I used, <coughs> sorry, I'm predicting to these block groups, if I use something like distance to roads here, roads are 
flowing through every block group. What would it be calculating the distance to, right? I have a polygon. The distance to the polygon when a road runs through a polygon is zero, right? Um, so what I'd, a better way to do it in this case is actually to create, again, a surface that represents that, um, that distance. And we can see that. And so that when we do that, instead of getting just a single distance for a polygon, we get an average value based on that Euclidean distance of that raster. And it's a much more appropriate way to model that distance feature. So we have to think, you know, it, this comes back to this idea that it's not magic. And we made it really easy. Like, there is no other place that you can run random forest as easily as you can here. But you still have to think about it. You do. Um, and that's important. Um, and so uh, the same thing here, we can go through, train our model, um, get a sense in this case of our R squared, right? Because our, in this case, it's not classification, it's not that sensitivity and accuracy, it's an R squared because we have an attribute value we're predicting. And we can see that we have that R squared of 0.86 um, and certainly a good enough model. I mean, that's a crazy good model. But you see, this is a, our, our, our our R squared is 86. You never want to look at the R squared right up. Well, I mean, you want to look at it because it'll give you a sense of it. But our R squared is 86. The R squared on the data that was used for training is 0.94. I've seen them be 0.99. I mean, the model is like perfectly tuned to the data that was used for training. I've had ones where my R squared for my test data is like 0.01. I mean, really bad model. Like, it is not a good model. But the R squared for the data used in training was like 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So without that test data, I really don't know how good of a job I'm doing. So that's a really important part. And luckily, it just does it for you. Um, so hopefully, this gives you a sense of kind of the flexibility of these tools. You know, it's not a spatial tool, but we really built it to work with spatial data. You can include those distance features. You can mix and match vector and raster data. I mean, there's basically, this is one of the first tools we've ever created that mixes so much vector and raster data. And I think it's just the beginning of the direction that we want to go in terms of helping you guys bridge that gap. The problems you're trying to solve don't care about vector or raster, right? So we want to make sure we're building tools that also don't care about vector or raster and just about solving the problem. Um, and we have to finish with our favorite quote, which is that essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, it's just could not be more true. Um, hopefully, you've had an awesome conference. We have, I have one more work, I have the one that's not on here is at two, 30, which is about uh, kind of a broad look at what's in machine learning in ArcGIS. And then we do this session again at 4. If you go to esriurl.com slash spatial stats, you'll find all sorts of resources, including these slides, workshops, hands-on tutorials. And we'd really appreciate your feedback. So please fill out a course survey. We don't get any course surveys anymore. And when we get eight responses from a room full of this many people, it's not a very statistically valid sample. So we'd really appreciate your feedback. Thank you, guys. Sorry for the room yeah, confusion. Thank you. <laughs>